going to be a little hard to follow, but we were singing <laughs> in the background. Can you hear it? You can do the background, so to speak. I am going to read the right scripture this morning that I failed to do a couple weeks ago. It's from the book of Hebrews, verse 1, chapter 1, verse 1 through 8. In the past, God spoke to our forefathers through the prophets at many times and in various ways. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed there of all things, and through whom he made the universe. The Son is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word. After he had provided purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty in heaven. So he became as much superior to the angels as the name he had inherited is superior to theirs, for which, for to which the angels uh, did God ever say, you are my son, today I have become your father. Or again, I will be his father and he will be my son. And again, when God brings uh, his firstborn uh, into the world, he says that all God's angels worship him. In speaking of the angels, he said, he makes his angels wing, winds, his servants flames of fire. But about the Son, he says, your throne, O God, will last forever and ever, and righteousness will be the scepter of your kingdom. You have loved your righteousness and your hated wickedness. This is the word of God for the people of God. There was something I read a few weeks ago. I'm not sure who wrote it, so I'm sorry I can't uh, cite my source. But someone along the way mentioned that believers have somewhat of, a, uh, of, of two conversions. The first conversion, a believer moves from the natural world or the natural self to the spiritual life. But then there is a second conversion in which the person moves from the spiritual back to the natural. It's another way of saying that our salvation doesn't remove us from our obligations and from the world, but rather allows us to see the world and our neighbors in a whole new way, from a heavenly perspective, from a perspective of God, from God's very eyes, to see things through a heavenly spiritual lens. It's an affirmation that the same Christ who was born anew in our hearts during Christmas time is the very same Christ who calls us to reach out to a world beyond us so that God's will may be done on earth as it is in heaven. Now as we move out into the new year, this is a call that we're going to long, we're going to, long to hear and continue to hear, a calling that brings us out into our community, into our local businesses, into our neighborhood, and to the world. And I want to just point out some things that I'd like for you to consider that we are doing this year as we make our way in trying to discern this call in the world today. For one, we want to continue to build relationships. You know that a calling in Christ is more than just becoming a disciple. The call is of a great commission in which we're, Jesus would have us not only be disciples, but continue to make disciples of others. So one of the things we're going to focus on this year is the idea of disciples making disciples. It's more than just coming to Sunday school or coming to a small group or showing up. Rather, making disciples is being intentional about investing in the lives of others in order to disciple them. Another area that we like to focus on this year as we think about the new year and how Christ is calling us with this heavenly call is to work with the nonprofits and businesses in our neighborhood. I've been meeting with leaders of nonprofits over the last year. Many have come in and have done need to know moments as we did, uh, as we've heard from some of our friends in the community this past year. And one of the things that we've been noticing is that there is a lack of communication between all of the nonprofits. As a result of that, there are many nonprofits that are overlapping services and, in some cases, just failing to collaborate or communicate together. 
One of the things that we like to do here at First Baptist Church is to broker that network so that nonprofits can work with one another and communicate with one another. So we're praying about hosting perhaps a quarterly or uh, some kind of lunch on a regular basis, maybe three times uh, a year, in order to gather the heads and the directors from different nonprofits to come so that we might not only be a good neighbor, but might help nonprofits communicate and collaborate better. We also want to think about our Nifty Fifties programs. Uh, not just the breakfast, but also the lunch. Harry and I were talking uh, this past week, and he was telling me about me how many of the speakers this year, many of the themes, will be hearing from you all, of how you have touched the world around you, how you have, min how you have ministered around you, the places that you've been, the people that you've met. So a lot of our Nifty Fifties lunches will focus on you as you reach out to your community. And Harry said, you know, if you know someone that is continually ministering in our community, let Harry know that he might schedule them to come speak. But we also know that we're out in our community in a multitude of ways. Uh, this morning, I, I want to highlight those who are in our church that work with the Florida Baptist uh, Relief, Emergency Relief. Uh, Johnny is wearing his yellow shirt. You can look back there and see it's nice and bright. That's the uh, famous uh, yellow shirt that the Florida Baptists wear when we do relief services, and of course Tom Kennedy is actually our uh, in charge of the region. Is that right? Or did you get uh, elected for that? Or did they, what's that? The Coast. Yeah, for the Treasure Coast. You're still in that position. So uh, pray for Tom. He has a big responsibility if uh, emergencies or natural disasters strike. Tom is our representative for this Treasure Coast. It's another way that we are reaching out in an intentional way, hoping to solidify that this year. And of course, we hope uh, by the time we get to November that we'll lead another group to Cuba for a mission trip. We're starting the Senior Bulletin uh, meeting once a month in order to pray and prepare for that possible mission trip by the end uh, of November. So we consider how we're worshiping and studying this year. And God is calling us out to, to not only call us beyond ourselves, but also to reach into the world. And we start with some of the studies that we're doing here at church this month. On Sunday mornings, we're going to spend some time in the book of Hebrews, as this is a book that reminds us who it is that we serve and why Jesus is worth serving, worth sharing, and worth talking about. And then also on Wednesday nights, as your bulletin attests, we're going to talk about the book of Revelation in Bible study. That is a book of hope, allowing Christians to engage the world in a way to see the world very differently from a heavenly perspective, all along affirming that we know the rest of the story. That because we know what God is about, because we're a part of God's kingdom, because we know how the story ends, we can be people of hope who point others to the love and salvation of Jesus Christ. It's like a horror movie. You, know, you ever watch a horror movie, you're wondering what's going to happen next. You're on the edge of your seat. But sometimes horror movies aren't that scary if you know how it ends. And this is kind of like that. We know how this story ends, and that brings hope. Now what's interesting about the book of Hebrews, which we're going to study on Sunday mornings, and the book of Revelation, which we're studying more extensively over the next four months, is that both Hebrews and Revelation were written around the same time. Somewhere around 88 to 96 AD, during a time when Christians were being persecuted and many Christians were facing a choice. Some were abandoning the faith. They said, this isn't worth it. I want to go back to my old life. I'm being too persecuted. Another choice was to retreat from the world and to gather around the uh, the put the, uh, the horse and the wagons in a circle, circle your wagons, and to react ho with hostility. And that was another option, but the author of Hebrews and the book of Revelation were there to provide hope and to continue to encourage the church to stay engaged in a world that God still loves, to continue to reach out and to fulfill the great commission that Jesus had given so many years before him. So let's talk a little bit about Hebrews. Maybe it's a book that you haven't studied in a while. And as a book of hope, as a book of encouragement, uh, E.F. Scott calls Hebrews the riddle of the New Testament. 
It's a riddle because we really don't know who wrote the book of Hebrews. There is no author appended at the beginning. And though tradition and history tells us that Paul is a possible candidate for the writing of the book of Hebrews, there really isn't much of uh, similarities between Paul's own writings and the book of Hebrews. So it may be Paul, but it may not. It's, it's a real mystery. And the other mystery is what to call Hebrews. It's not necessarily a letter or an epistle like the other letters in the New Testament. So many scholars believe that by looking at the arguments and by looking at the content, it some clues in the text that it is more of a sermon or a homily. So here we have in our New Testament a snapshot of a sermon or what a sermon would have been like back in the early church. And throughout the text, it gives clues towards that. In chapter 3, verse 1, for instance, the author says that this is a confession. And it is a confession in which the author is confessing who Christ is and confessing our relationship to Christ. It's a confession in a way that affirms that Jesus is worth worshiping and worth serving, not someone that we should give up on. In chapter 13, the author says that these are words of exhortation, a source of encouragement during a time of hardship. We also see this idea of words of exhortation being used in sermons in the book of Acts. So when we see sermons in the book of Acts, and the author calls that a word of exhortation, we also see that this is referring to itself as a word of exhortation, encouragement. But even then, it's a source of challenge as well. A source of challenge. Throughout the sermon, we see that the author reminds his readers to not harden their hearts, to listen to the Word of God. Not only to find encouragement in God's Word, but to face the challenge to grow in Christ and become mature Christians who engage the world in a way that Jesus allows God's reign to go before the entire earth. And so we see that the author here bridges the Old Testament with the New by affirming that Jesus is the culmination of that story that started so long ago from the creation. That Jesus not only is a part of that story, but was there from the beginning as one who brought creation into the world. A part of God's master plan that Jesus might bring the fulfillment of all that we read in the Old Testament. That God's reign not only may break out on earth, but become a part of this world. In fact, that's what Revelation and Hebrews have in common. Both books affirm what I started this sermon with about two conversions, affirm that we are called out into the world to join Jesus at work. And if you read Hebrews and you read Revelation, you find that there's a constant movement of heaven breaking into earth until that final day when the throne of God ascend, descends to earth and Jesus creates a new heaven and a new earth, finally and totally. So it starts, it begins, and ends with Christ Jesus. I like how Hebrews chapter 1 verse 6 puts it. That Jesus is the firstborn into the world. That Jesus' posture is not one that retreats from the world, but rather takes on the world and allows God's reign to break in the world in many different ways. We see this at Christmas, of course, which we just celebrated, where God chooses to come into the flesh in the person of Jesus Christ to dwell with us, Emmanuel, God with us. We call that the incarnation, the idea that God has come in the flesh, a way of saying that we are worth saving. But then, at the baptism of Christ, we see that Jesus is worth serving. Because as soon as Jesus goes into those baptismal waters and comes out, God affirms that that is his son, with whom he is well pleased. And the primary message of Jesus' sermon is not one of retreat or hostility, but rather of the inbreaking of the kingdom of God in the world and the call and mission of those who follow him, not only to make disciples, but to allow that God's reign to transform all of their surroundings. It's not an escape from the world, but a call to the world. But I think what Hebrews 
really emphasizes is who is it that we are serving? Who is this Jesus who is born anew in our hearts that we follow? And following in Patty's sermon, I'd like to give you four snapshots that Hebrews gives us of who Jesus is. What the saint, what the early church father, St. Thomas Aquinas, called the pictures that gives us the excellency of Christ. And the first picture we have from the first chapter of Hebrews is that Jesus is with us, not only by showing us the glory of, of God, but by suffering alongside us and knowing the humility and the service of what it means to walk with us. You see, I worship Jesus. I don't know about you, but I worship Jesus not only because I know him personally, but because Jesus doesn't stand at a distance from me. Jesus is intimate with me. Jesus knows what it's like to cry and to grieve. Jesus knows what it's like to suffer and to lose. And Jesus knows what it's like for a body to ache and things to hurt, for grief to set in. And when Hebrews talks about the excellency of Christ, it makes sure to say that part of that excellency is the idea that Jesus humbled himself and equated himself with us to walk with us in service. And to me, that is a God worth serving and worth praising. A God who walks with us. But we also see throughout the book of Hebrews, not just in this chapter, but a portrait that we see in the book, is that Jesus is also called the high priest. That as the high priest, Jesus comes on our behalf and doesn't offer a sacrifice of any old lamb, but rather offers his own life for our sins as our high priest, our mediator between us and God in order to bridge that gap so that we might become intimate with God. And as the high priest, Jesus not only offers himself as sacrifice, but is lifted up, glorified, and put in a place of authority. So not only does Jesus condescend to us, humble himself to walk with us, but through his act of sacrifice, we see that Jesus is lifted up to a place worthy of worship, that we too may lift him up. Another portrait that Hebrews paints is that of Jesus who brings the new, the new covenant. We see this when Jesus ate with his disciples and gathered those disciples around him when he said that the sacrifice of his body, that ultimate sacrifice on behalf of our sins, is the, is the act of beginning that new covenant between God and between us. You see, God is a God of covenants. All the way back to creation, God makes covenants because God is one who makes promises. And part of that covenant is to continue to redeem the people of God until it finds its final redemption and fulfillment in Christ Jesus, who is the one who ushers in a new covenant for us. You see, this is one of the reasons why I think that Jesus got baptized. We often wonder, why did Jesus get baptized? Did he need to get baptized? What, what's the deal with him being baptized? And for me, it's the establishment and the sign of this new covenant. You see, the reason for the baptism and the reason why John the Baptist was out there baptizing people was to allow them to reenact that act of coming out of Egypt. Do you remember when God saved Israel from Egypt, they passed through the Red Sea. So the act of baptism was the symbol of coming out of slavery in order to live into God's liberation and freedom, in order to be God's people, to be freed up, to be God's people. So that act of baptism was a way of symbolically reenacting that commitment to God to be God's people. So when Jesus comes and gets baptized, he is coming with us in solidarity with us and saying that he is the one to usher the people of God in that new covenant of establishing God's people once again to be the redeemed family of God, to create a new covenant and a new household in line with the King of David. Did you know that that sentence that we find both in Hebrews 1 and at the baptism of Christ, where God says, you are my son and in whom I am well pleased, do you know that that goes back to the Old Testament? To 2 Samuel chapter 7, I believe it's in verse 14, when God is making a covenant with David, and God tells David that 
God will establish David's throne forever, and David's offspring, the root of Jesse, will sit on the throne to usher in the final covenant that was made long ago with Abraham to be a blessing to all nations. And that's where God says that that royal heir will be the one whom God will call son and beloved. So we find here that Jesus is the fulfillment of that new covenant made all the way back through the Old Testament until now. And the last portrait that Hebrews paints for us is a picture that Jesus continues to call us to follow in his footsteps to be the community of ministers and priests and missionaries who are called to join God at work in the world. Jesus has come to walk with us. And as baptized believers now, we are called to walk with Jesus out into the world where Jesus is still at work. That's why we get at the middle of Hebrews, the statement in chapter 3, verse 1 specifically, where the author says that we are partners, holy partners, in a heavenly calling. That God continues to call us out into the world in order to join Jesus at work, to do what we talked about last week, in order to articulate salvation, to give gifts of peace and justice and restoration to the world. That's why we get in Hebrews chapter 10 and Hebrews chapter 11, that great cloud of witnesses. You remember that? When we get to Hebrews chapter 10 and 11, we'll recall the, the hall of faith, where the author recalls all of these superheroes of old. He says that we are joining in that holy roster of people of faith as we join God at work in the world, as we come, become fellow ministers to see ourselves as ministers and missionaries, and even priests. Now, you may have grown up in an environment where you said, well, the ministers, we'll leave that to the ordained folks. We'll leave that to Joe and Lance and Michael and the church staff. But that's not what it means to be holy partners in a heavenly call. You are called to be ministers where you work, where you live and move and how you have your being in your neighborhood. And when your ministry comes to a place where you don't have to have a public proclamation or you don't have someone to talk to, then your role as a priest takes over in which you're called to go to God in order to intercede on behalf of those whom you know and love. So we are called to be ministers out serving the world, but also called to be priests, mediating on behalf of the world by coming before God and praying for one another and for our neighbors and for our world. We are to be a church of prayer, a church of ministers, a church of missionaries who are called not only to serve, but to pray in the name of Jesus. And when we say you pray in the name of Jesus, that's not just to do it because we've done it all our life. We pray in the name of Jesus because we believe that Jesus is the risen Christ who continues to work on our behalf and who is alive and well, who is, continues to work in the world. So when we pray in the name of Jesus, we are joining Jesus in an affirmation that God is still in the business of saving the world. You have heard me quote it before, and I'm going to quote it again. That God is at work in the world. John 3.16 tells us so. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever shall believe in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. And I encourage you, don't forget verse 17. God sent his Son into the world not to what? Condemn the world, but that the world might be saved through him. So we pray in Jesus' name, and we pray in Jesus' name, and we serve Christ because we know that Jesus is the high priest, that Jesus walks with us in service, that Jesus is exalted as the one who brings us the new covenant and establishes that covenant by extending the reign of the kingdom, by being firstborn into the world to lead the way that we might be God's children in the world as well to walk with Brother Christ, and to give glory to God our Father, to be empowered by the Spirit, and to live and walk as Christ walks, as we proclaim the good news as we always have done. This is a call not to trust in your own devices, not to necessarily succeed in your strengths, but to allow God to use you and to work through both your strengths and your weaknesses in order to bring about the good news of what it means to be a Christ follower. 
And over the past three, uh, three weeks, probably a month, I've been praying about how to move from here. You know, it's, it's always good for a pastor to have a new vision for a new year, and I've been praying about a vision to figure out, you know, where are we going to go this year as a church? And every time I pray that prayer, and every time I spend praying with God about that, I always just continue to get this affirmation that we continue to encourage one another to be disciples making disciples, to be at work in the world, to join Jesus at work. You know, a lot of pastors, what they'll do at the beginning of the year is they'll start some new big program, try to ignite their church with some new big series or some big theme or, or some new ministry. And, you know, I prayed about that. Is that where we need to move? And, and I always get the sense, you know, you guys are busy enough. Some of you do the work of the church. You're called into the work of the church. But many of you are busy. You don't need something new to do. Many of you are doctors or teachers. You're in the workforce. You're, uh, you, you have a routine in which you meet with people. Some of you are excellent bridge players. Grandmas and grandpas. There are some resident curmudgeons among us, I'm sure. And there are even people who are caregivers. People who care for one another. People who care for other people that they're not even supposed to be responsible for. People who perhaps meet with others in their, in, uh, in their living facility and have lunch. You, you all are busy people. So you don't need a church that gives you more of a workload or makes you busy. But we do need to be called to be the church that equips you for ministry and walks alongside you to encourage you to walk with Jesus wherever you find yourself. I'm going to encourage you. Let us know where you're at work in the world. Let us know how we can equip you for ministry so that you might walk with Jesus where he is already at work. And we pray that in this call this year, as you fulfill the great commission to make disciples, that you will live into your vocation and your calling as a minister and missionary of our risen Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.